worship. We thank you so much for just your Holy Spirit being in this place today, Father. We thank you so much that we can have healing in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you so much for your son who died on the cross for us that we have this opportunity to praise and to worship. Father, we thank you. We love you so much. It's in your son Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 You may be seated. Praise the Lord. He is worthy of all praise. Amen. As always, it's exciting to be in the house of the Lord. And as we go through these perilous times, uh, God has put a series on me years ago, and I did some of it. But I was uh, blessed with the opportunity to finally finish it. And so for the next six weeks, you're going to hear the same uh, message with six different threads in it. It's going to be titled The Bait of Satan. So we begin to think about the bait of Satan. In this first message, The Bait of Satan, we're going to give you some things that we need to really look at and six different components to let us know that whether it was 2,000 years ago, 3,500 years ago, or three days ago, or five days from now, it's the same. It really is. And God has always been the answer. Amen. Amen. And so we talked about this. So many people today, and we talked about this out of Revelation, how in the end times the church is going to want their ears to be tickled and there's going to be false doctrine introduced to the church. That's right. And so uh, I'm just going to tell you this, what's going on right now. Amen. Uh, people and friends of mine are uh, beginning to do things that that is not in line with God's word. And I'm not sure why. And I think some of our jobs as Christians is to follow the truth. And our job is to really, if we see a brother or sister going astray, we're calling back. So let me just make it clear for you that this pulpit is to be protected by God's word. Yeah. Amen? Amen. So what I mean by that is this, is that we're all wretched sinners in need of God's amazing grace. Yeah. We're not polluted with false teaching. And so today, I'm perplexed in my spirit as other brothers as invite people of other faith to fulfill their pulpit and to see another side of something. But to see it's the same yesterday, today, and forever. If you don't believe that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the answer to all, then we've got a problem. Amen? Amen. And when we're not people of other faiths to stand in your pulpit and preach something contrary to the Word of God, there's something wrong. So we need to take uh, really heed to that. That's what this is threatened with, the bait of Satan. It's important for us to remember the bait's there. It might have looked good. It might even last for a season, but if it's contrary to the Word of God, it'll burn up and, and you know, what I said, it'll, it'll blow off going up, burn off going down. Amen? So we've got to be careful with what we allow. So today, I'm going to be teaching to you out of Luke, just the, the 17th chapter, but I really want you to, before you turn there, just to focus on some things. There's four discipleship pr uh, promises that we need to fulfill in Luke 17 as we look at it. Those things that we are supposed to be doing and being aware of is this. False teaching, okay, forgiveness, faith, and service. Those are the four things. So this week, I want to talk about false teaching. As we begin to look at false teaching, I don't got to tell you anything, anything that you don't already know. If you're not studying the Word of God, uh, things can go haywire really quick. And so I often say this to you from this platform also, is that everything I tell you is a lie. And so you line it up with the Word of God, and I still believe that. So your faith can never be in man. It's got to be in Christ. Amen? It needs to be in Christ, so that's what we must study the Word to find ourselves approved. There's plenty of false teachers, there's a lot of false doctrine, a lot of falseness that has come our way. And I'm going to talk about this today with a little spin on it so it makes us more understand us personally. Amen? And as I'm preaching this, somebody's going to say, oh, yes. And somebody might be saying about you, oh, yes. So be careful with your OBSs is why I share that with you. But the first aspect of the discipleship here is expressed in, the, in chapter 17, the first three verses. It's, it's, it's expressed as a warning, if you will, not to be a cause of anyone else's sin. So we should not be a cause of anybody else's sin. And this is where the woe is in this message. It is inevitable that sin will come, and it will come through false teaching, but woe to the person who brings that uh, false teaching or that offense, if you will, to the person. The offense Jesus discusses here. It's probably a serious sin that causes stumbling and even a fall possibly from faith. And so as we begin to look at this, so the warning addresses teaching that leads a loss of, and think about this, and we say this all the time, that would never happen to me. But I share this often, is that the people that was around uh, back in the dinosaur age when I got saved, I watched all of them go away from faith, not all of them, but the majority of them. I've seen them come to a place where they begin to Lose faith, walk away, become lukewarm, or whatever it may be. 
Now, I just want to say this in a season of following Christ, at a time where we like we're facing adversity in our country today, from every angle. So often we just want to shut up and sit in the back seat. That's not what you was told to do. You hear me? Yeah. You just, you have a political view. You have a view as a Christian that you need to stand up and line up with the Word of God and be spoken about what God wants us to do as a country. But sit back and do nothing and allow the devil to have his reign is not who we're called to be. Amen. In your family, in your friendships, in your workplaces, it's the same way. God has called you to be his disciple, and a disciple is through faith, not by false doctrine, amen, not opinions of man. So when we start looking at this, so the warning addresses teaching that leads to a loss of faith, or it really it leads to from faith to a life of sin. God's concern for his children is seen in Jesus' character, characterization of them as little ones in verses 2 and 3. It begins to talk about the little ones, and so often we might get that confused. In fact, those who, who lead others really truly in error are at risk the, the, you know, the, before God anyway. But when it talks about little ones, let's not get confused that we're talking just about little kids. We're talking about those who are little in faith. So often what happens, we think the little in faith is everybody in another church or somebody other than me. But when I am growing in faith, I'm a little one. When I'm studying the Word of God, I'm a little one. When I am learning, I am a little one. When it's happening, God begins to teach and to grow us. So it really doesn't matter how old you are, how good in faith or solid in faith you think somebody is. Woe to you if you cause anyone to sin because of you. Amen? Amen. Well, let's go to Luke chapter 17, verse number 1, if you'll stand for the reading of the Word. Very short verse. A lot of action here in Luke 17, 1. And here Jesus warns, and it says, of offenses. Everybody say offense. Yes. And when we look at offenses, it's a disregard uh, for oneself or one standard of, of principles, okay? So uh, let me just read the word. It says in verse 1, it says, Then he said to the disciples, It is impossible, it is impossible that no offenses should come, but woe to him through whom they do come. Father, we thank you for this word this morning, God. And we ask that you would open our eyes, Father God, and spiritually, God, allow us to look at your word. And God, clean individually and collectively, Father God, what you would teach us today through this lesson. God, we give you all praise for what you're about to do. God, now begin to position yourself in our hearts, in our minds, and our souls, God, to receive what you have for us. Father, we love you, we praise you, and we invite you to be here. From the beginning to end, it's in the name of Jesus Christ we pray and everyone said. Amen. 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 You may be seated. When we look at this, this verse... It's certainly worth looking at over and over again. But when you look at this verse, it says, Then he said to the disciples, It is impossible to have no offenses. And this is where the scripture uh, it really comes to life to us. It's absolutely impossible for you not to be offended, is what this is saying. Amen? Amen. So some of us who get offended so easily, like my wife, it's so easy for you to be offended. She said, I'm the sensitive one. Right? She said, Yeah, I ain't saying it, girl. I'm watching you. <laughs> But it is easy to be offended, isn't it? Yes. Okay, so I don't know about you, but if you've ever been offended, and, and I mean like when somebody's talking to you and contrary to the Word of God, when they're trying to tell you the truth of something that is not, they got a twist on or a skew, I was like, man, that offends me. This week I got to thinking about what example would I use for this week? What has offended me lately? I got to thinking about a pastor friend who's inviting someone from another community to come in and have his pulpit this week. I was offended. I said, that guy does not believe that Jesus is the Son of God. He's allowing him to fulfill the pulpit. What is wrong with us? I was offended. Can you say I'm offended? I'm offended. Man. Man. And we should be when we are seeing or hearing stuff that's contrary to the Word of God. It's important that we begin to really line up with what the Word says and not what our opinion does. <coughs> Excuse me. When we read this scripture and we think about offense, that really the message today is for us to think about this offense in the scripture. It says, things that cause people to stumble are bound to come. Okay? The things that cause people to stumble, it's going to happen. You know what I'm talking about? Those pastors, it seems like everybody's shoving down the road trying to encourage them. Somewhere there, they always turn around and bite So it's like you're trying to pull your dog into the corner. Come on, come on, come on. Ow, did it. Well, I'm trying to help you. Okay? So we seen this yesterday. The dog jumps out of the truck and, uh, and uh, you know, back of the truck to go over the intersection. Okay? As so it jumps out, it's all right. Ran around. The guy pulled it over. And I said, come on up here anyway. When he got on the doggy, he smacked the dog out of the dog. <laughs> All right? And the doggy seems snap on a snap at him. But at the same time, he's telling him, I'm trying to keep you from getting killed. What's wrong with you? How often is it like us? Is that God's trying to help us along? Amen? But we want to be offended by what God is helping us with, so we'll walk away from God. Mm -hmm. 
No. Can you say amen? Amen. Now, when you look at the scripture, <coughs> excuse me again, it's one of those, when we think about, it, you know, there's an things that can cause a person to stumble. And it's bound to come when you're offended. It is one of the enemy's most deadly and it's the most deceptive traps that there is. It imprisons countless Christians over and over again. It severs relationships and widens the existing breaches between you and I. What are we talking about? It is the trap of offense. It is the trap of offense. So we start looking at this trap at the bait of Satan and we get offended so often. I don't want to go to that church ever again. I really hope I offend you today. Amen. Amen? Amen. I don't want you to offend me, but I want to offend you with the Word of God because we get better and stronger. That's how we're supposed to be. Now, if you look at a fist so often, I might say something from up here that perplexes you. You might say something to me while looking at you and go, What? You might say, Have you prayed for this? Oh, you may pray contrary to the Word of God. And no. Say, Amen. 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 I'm trying to get some help here, but the truth is this is that. We've got to be careful when it comes to this offense. The offense, and it's very clear here in 17, 1 of the loop that it's very much going to happen. Over and over again, we're going to offend each other. That's part of life. But we've got to be careful with how we handle and how we process the offense because we will not want our offense to turn into sin. And if it turns into sin, we call someone else to sin, then whoa. Whoa unto us. Okay? Is everybody still with me? Now, the 55th Psalm says this, and David laments here, and let's get this right in our minds. In the 55th Psalm of verse 12 through 14, as we're talking about this trap of the fist that we're trapped in, we begin to look at what David pens here. He says, for it is not an enemy who reproaches me. It is not an enemy who reproaches me. This is what we're talking about uh, some things today. We're talking about an offense, and we're going to talk about betrayal, and we're going to talk about traps, amen? We're going to talk about how things begin to happen. In order for these things to happen, uh, we've got to begin to know how it can even happen. When you look at this, it says, who reproaches me, it invokes destruction, or it, it's really, truly, it's an insult towards who I think I am or who I perceive myself to be. So if you begin to insult me or invoke destruction where I'll turn away, whoa, well, unto me. Woe well, unto you, right? Yeah, Let's keep going. For it is not an enemy who reproaches me that I can bear it, nor is it uh, one who hates me who has exalted himself against me, then I can hide from him. I can hide from the enemy. And here it is. Look at this. Verse 13. But it was you. Can you imagine what David said? But it was you? Tim, I can't. It was you? That, me? You? Think about this. You catch him on where he's at here. Because this is about reproach and prayer, amen. This is where it's, it's odd because... And as you begin to read this song, all of a sudden he stops in the middle of prayer and says, I want to address you. As a matter of fact, you have offended me. That's what's going on here. That doesn't happen in the songs. But here, there's a reason. There's a reason through the prayer where he stops and he addresses individually. Let me keep going. Check this out. Nor is it one who hates you, as it goes through that, it says, but it was you, a, a man, my equal, my companion, and my acquaintance. So what he's bringing here now is he's making it, he's making it personal, amen? He's making it personal between me and you. There, there's been an error here of our ways. There's been a way, there's been a reproach or something that's happening here. Uh, what was to you? Because I thought I trusted you. I thought you was on the inner court. I thought you was on my team. I thought we was together. I thought, you know what I'm talking about? There's an address here that's important that we need not to skip. Let's get past verse 14. We took sweet counsel together. And we walked to the house of God in the throne. Now, the first thing is, who is this? And when we look at this, you think about it, he's holding himself against me. It's talking about arrogance. It's talking about someone who says, yeah, we're close, but I'm a little bit better than you. That's the person I'm talking about. Everybody behind their back, including you. Everybody hear me? I'm not a bit tighter than that. No, I'm being really tight. I'm tight to your face. I'm going to keep going. Talk about my equal. Who was his equal? My companion, my acquaintance here. It was a hit of fall. That's who it was. So who was that? Well, you start thinking about who it was and the betrayal and the act that came out of that. He acted as part of the devil's counsel. What he was doing is what hit of fall was doing. He was addressing it here. It's important that remember, he was just like Judas. And remember this. For someone to give you the kiss on the face, they've got to be inside your inner court before they can kiss you anyways. On the face, amen? amen. Let me keep on. 
Benefel was a counselor of a King David and a man greatly renowned for his wisdom in the time of war. We know that it was a falling away. But what was expected here when he says, my equal, my companion, and my acquaintance was, he was expecting and he had a right to expect humanity and kindness and tenderness. That's what he was expecting because that's what he had given. And he was expecting it in return. Mm -hmm. Some of you might be saying, Where, where's he going with this? Some of you say, I already got it. I've been betrayed before. Mm -hmm. If you've ever been betrayed, been, been betrayed, let me just be honest with you. If someone betrays you, you already don't like, thank God, they're out of your life. But if someone in your inner court begins to betray you, a spouse, a child, a grandchild, a co-worker, whoever it is that you trusted, the betrayal is a holy another level. Can you say amen? amen? Nothing hurts more than a wound from a friend. When you think about a friend wound, you begin to look at what was going on here. David was sharing with us his heart in this prayer as he began to call out the one that had betrayed him, which he thought he could trust forever. At times, friends may need to lovingly confront us in order to help us, whether it's correcting or, or teaching us or rebuking us. But betrayal, it hurts, and it hurts really super deep. Betrayal of a friend caused David a great anguish here. And don't betray those you love is the, power, the punch point that we always say. If you love someone, the last thing that should be on your scope is betrayal. They, they are uh, those whom we sit with and sing alongside, or perhaps this one, like myself, delivering a sermon today. We spend holidays with them. We attend social functions. We share offices right beside them for years at a time. Or perhaps it's even closer than that. We grow up with them. We confide in them. We sleep next to them. The closer the relationship, the more severe the offense. The closer the relationship, the more severe the offense. You, you find the greatest hatred among people who are once extremely close. Amen? Amen. I was talking to a brother today about this and about how uh, things go in families when death happens. The famous, the closest to end, you said, the them apart. The people who want the most out of somebody, the ones who think they got it all together, the devil will find a way to begin to sow deceit into any family, into any relationship. That's what we have to be on guard about, amen? Because we are better than that. We are stronger than that because of the Holy Spirit that lives inside of you and I. He quickens our spirit. He begins to tell us, I've already told you to watch out for that trap, amen? We talk about that trap, the trap of the fence, and all of a sudden, I can't believe they would treat me like that. Why can't you believe that they would treat you like that? They treated Jesus like that. That's right. His 12 disciples that loved him the very most, when he needed them the very most, they would betray him, they would deny him, and the other 10 cowards would walk away from him. Right when he would break bread with them, he said, well, I'll just go ahead and show you how to do it anyway. It's not about what's before me. I'll take out the all outer garment. I'll step down to the lowliest detail, and I'll begin to wash your feet, and you won't know what's going on now, but I'll tell you this, uh, sometime soon you will do as I have done. Amen. So no matter what the offense is, no matter what the betrayal is, we've got to position and condition our hearts to receive the betrayal the right way. Selfishness is what reigns in our society. Okay? Everybody say, oh, man. Oh. Hear in amen for a minute on this one. So we begin to look at selfishness, and honestly, it seems like the farther we go down the road, we become very selfish people. And I'm not saying it to be rude, but I know that's something that we should all have to find and take authority over. Men and women today look out for themselves, old number one. Well, how's that? You always tell your kids uh, when you go to school, they're picking on you, you stick up for old number one, you bust them right in the nose, they talk to you like that or treat you that way. And so you begin to think about that. What do you mean by that? What do you mean by taking care of that and teaching them in a way that's contrary to the word, amen? That's how we do it, right? Maybe it's just my house. Okay, maybe that's how I taught my kids. And I told somebody that they've got uh, kids from 37 to 7 now that's in my, been in my home. And today, 30 years later, I'm starting to get it. So I tell them, pray for them. It'll be a kind of ball. I said, you really going to pray for them? I said, yeah, I sure did. Yeah, I did. I told them, Jesus is going to get you, man. <laughs> he says, I'm telling you, I want to turn Jesus loose on you. Hey, how are you going to do that? I'm going to pray to him. You begin to think about that. That's a total different change in teaching, but that's my dynamics in teaching, right? I learned from 37 years of parenting that, man, I probably need to change some things because I've learned from my mistakes. It's easy for us to do that. It's easy for us to make the wrong decision. The Bible is very clear that in the last days, men will be lovers of themselves. And when we talk about this, all you women say, yeah, they sure are. 
We must be prepared. Check this out. We must be prepared and armed. We must at all times be prepared and armed for offenses. That's the trap of offense, okay? Offenses. Because our response determines our future. Our response determines our future. Think about this. Woe well, to anyone who would make another one stumble. We begin to think about so often if we, if we offend somebody, who cares? Remember, love it yourself. They shouldn't have messed with me. They should have given me the premium table. They shouldn't have flipped me off. No man to flip them off. They shouldn't have swung at me. No man to shoot them. See, we got all excuses, right? But do they represent Christ? Do they represent? Because when Christ could have powered up, he powered down for you and I. And the same thing goes for us. When we think we have the right to power up, or really our opportunity is to power down and reflect Christ. And when you look at this, we must be prepared and armed for the fences when they're happening, as we know they're going to happen, because our response determines our future and what we'll do for all eternity. We have a job to do. The second one, after we talk about that, uh, the first one is it's definitely a trap, and it's called a fence. We have understood that a fence, one of the enemy's most deadly traps, that I mentioned at the beginning, is the trap of deception. The trap of deception. Okay, the trap of deception. Let this sink into you. Have you ever been to see? Couple of those? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Woo! I mean, y'all, I can sit down and you can preach on this one. You talk about deception. You talk about being deceived. That's a tool then. I thought it was like this, but it wasn't like that at all. I think I'll tell you the person who directed that, man. They can sell some junk, can't they? <laughs> As seen on TV. That right there means that's from the devil. They don't see me. It says it looks good, looks good. You get it. They want to get you out of package. First thing, it's probably broke. That's seen on TV. They just didn't show you that part. But you begin to look at the trap of deception here. Well, first of all, the Greek word for offend, when you look at it, really get the brain, it's called scandal. So it's scandal, okay? When you look at deception, it's a scandal. That's right, in the, in the Greek, in the, in the original language, we begin to unpack this, and we really want to understand what deception is. Now, so often we need to do our spiritual check for ourselves. Are we being deceptive? Are we leading astray? Are we, are we making you think something that's not true? So whatever it might be, let's put it out there. This word originally referred to the part of the trap, though. So we're talking about this trap. So you can imagine that's quite a rat trap that ran in the one finger in it. But uh, she, she didn't want to volunteer for it. But when you look at this, this, this trap, you think about it. You think about that big old rat trap we talked about. And see it's got this spring on the snap. Right where you put that bait at. Right where you put that bait at. That's what that's referring to, which was the bait that was attached to it. Hence, the word signified a thin. When you look at it, it means laying a trap. So we start looking at it. They're laying a trap and we've been offended. And what's really happening is I've got to be deceitful to lay the trap or the fence. So I begin to defend, deceit you to get you to understand I'm going to offend you, amen? But deceit doesn't come out and say I'm deceiving you. It's going to say I'm going to end up offending you. So it looks at it this way. The New Testament often describes the entrapment used by the enemy. Offense is a tool of the devil to bring people into captivity. When you look at this, what Timothy was doing here, uh, those who are confused about faith so often in 2 Timothy 2, 24 and 26, Paul's instruction here to Timothy, and a servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle to all, able to teach, it says, patient and humility, correcting those who are in opposition. Now let's stop. You call yourself an evangelist? You call yourself, yeah, we're all evangelists, right? Yeah. All right, so here you go. When you call yourself someone who's sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ or the good news, you start looking at this trap that's been laid, uh, you begin to see what Timothy is, 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 is going on here in 2 Timothy 2, 24 6. It says, and, you know, we, I've got to really get our minds wrapped around this. And when it talks about teaching, being patient, and humility, correcting those, and there's a key, some keys there, who are in opposition. You hear me? You are in opposition, so if you're going out and you're speaking to the Muslim, the, the Muslim brothers and sisters, and you're going out talking to anybody that's contrary, anybody that's never been saved, you have an opposition that's setting before you, amen? amen. And your job ain't to go out and act like a holier than now. It says that we are to teach patiently in humility, correcting those who are in opposition. If God perhaps will grant them repentance so that they may know the truth. The truth will set them free, Amen. And that they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil, having been taken captive by him to do his will. Those who are in quarrels or opposition fall into a trap and are held prisoner to do the devil's will. Have you ever met them? Have you ever been them before Christ? 
We're doing the devil's will before we know Christ. Not too difficult to see that, is it? So often we get ourselves in these positions and predicaments before we know Christ, but we shouldn't after we know Christ. We need to allow the Spirit to convict us. Even more alarming, they're unaware that they're even trapped in captivity with the way they're doing like the prodigal. They must have come to themselves by awakening to their true condition. They do not realize that they are spewing out bitterness and bitter waters instead of pure water for them, for them to drink of. In James chapter 3, verses 9 through 11, with the tongue we praise our Lord and Father. And with it we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. Think about this. Think about what we're talking about here. Verse 10, out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. Look at the meat here. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? Well, it ought not to. Right? Amen. Our own contradictory speech often puzzles even ourselves. What's that look like? Well, that's church today, man, it's a good church. Man, I was having a man, I was having a good time. And then all of a sudden that dude cut me off. I was praising God on this side, and I was cursing God's creation on the other side. Oh. We've got a problem. Sometimes our words are good and pleasing to God, and then at other times, they're hurtful and they're very destructive to God's creation. The tongue itself is a constant reminder of our sinful nature. The tongue itself is a constant reminder of the sinful, na the sinful nature. When a person is deceived, they believe they are right, even though they are not. And our tongue will help them keep us keep them on the path that we think where they need to be at. That's so often what we do. When a person is deceived, they believe they are right, even though they are not. Anybody get any man there? Yes. Get a single one. Amen! I'll give myself one. No matter what the scenario is, we can divide uh, all the offended people into two categories. All the offended people into two categories. Those who have been treated unjustly, that's one. You've definitely been treated unjustly and done wrong. And those who believe they've been treated unjustly, that's the two categories. You can either be treated unjustly or you can believe that you've been treated unjustly. People in the second category believe, however, with all their hearts that they have been wronged. Often their conclusions are drawn from inaccurate information. From inaccurate information, or their information is accurate, but their conclusion is absolutely distorted against what God says. Either way, they hurt, and their understanding begins to be darkened. They judge by assumption, they judge by appearance, and they often also judge by hearsay. Amen? Amen. I got quiet on that one. <laughs> Because think about that. How many times have you judged what someone else told you? Yeah. That's why the Bible says, you've got a problem with the person. Everybody says, hey, I want you to go and beat and talk to so and so. I said, well, you talk to them yet? And I said, I'm not going with you. Well, I thought, I said, if you go to them first, almost 100% of the time it works out. That's why the Bible put that word in there. Amen. Amen. It's good to people. Because a lot of times it's not even true. It's false. There's something in here that we think is right. It's not. It's distorted. The enemy does it. causes it darkness. We know that. But be real and be honest. But always do it in love. Third day that I want to share this morning, not only offended, and we're also deceived, we need to understand the heart's true condition. Now, after this series of six weeks, I'm going to preach, I'm going to preach on the heart for three weeks. But when we get done, we'll need it. Amen? <laughs> because we begin to look at this heart. It's deceitful, it's beyond pure, who the world can understand it. Amen? But it's also the most free of life. Amen? So we begin to look at these different things, but the heart's true condition. When we look at the condition of the heart after we've been offended, after we've been deceived, after we've been done wrong. Some of the people I've seen happen to this lot are the most rock solid Christians I've ever met. Amen? Because yeah. if you've ever been offended, you've never been deceived, you're going to have a heart condition, one or the other. And I've shared mine often how I said, oh, I'm, I, I forgive and I've been delivered until that person crossed my path and said, I'm going to kill you. Mm -hmm. I was like, where did that come from? Because I really didn't mean it, though. My mouth sure spoke it because I was hard for my speaker. Remember that time we just talked about? Right. The heart's true condition. One way, check this out, one way the enemy keeps a person in an offended state is to keep the offense hidden and cloak with pride. Oh, yeah. mm. Ouch. Yeah. Yeah. Ouch. This is me personally. This is something I wrote for just me. And that doesn't work to, for any of you guys. Yeah. But I'm preaching to me. But one way the enemy keeps a person in an offended state is to keep that offense hidden and cloaked with pride. Nobody's ever had to swallow no pride around here. When we look at pride, pride will keep you from admitting your true condition. Pride will keep you from admitting 
That's what Friday does. I don't know what they think they are. They're talking to them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You understand it. I am. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Pride. What comes before the fall? Pride. Pride. Pride, yes, thank you. It distorts our vision. It distorts your vision when you begin to think about pride and how we see ourselves, how we see other people, how we're always right, they're always wrong, or whatever it might be. You never change when you think that you're just fine and everything is okay. Pride hardens your heart, it dims your eyes, it dims your understanding, it does not let you allow to get a grasp on what you really need to keep you from the change of heart. It keeps you from repentance, which will set you free. That's what it keeps you from. We mentioned 2 Timothy here a few minutes ago. Back to the same scripture, it talks about this. Pride causes you to view yourself as a victim. Everybody say victim. Amen. Now, I want some of you to think about this. It's been years ago. I said, we, I did a sermon on this. I said, we're one of two V's in our life. We're either the V for victim or the V for victorious. Amen? Amen. Victory means we live with Jesus. Victim means we are a snake and a venom spewer. Everywhere we go, we're like a snake, biting everybody, biting everybody. It's everybody else's fault. Why me? Why them? And all we can do is we get a click around us, whether it's our family or a friend or someone else, a co-worker, and they're just like me. Everybody else is the problem. We have no problem, problem gospel about everybody else. But when you get to the end of this, man, that's all we do is talk about people. Amen? Okay, well, let me keep going. I'm trying to, I'm trying to get somewhere. Everybody say amen. I need it. Amen. amen. Thank you. We need, we need to keep moving. Pride calls us some serious issues. Though your heart, true heart condition is hidden from you, we know that we can get to this place where your pride causes you to view yourself as the victim. Wow. Your attitude becomes, I was mistreated or I was misjudged. Therefore, I'm justified in my behavior. I will tear them down. They tore me down first. They should never raise a hand against me because you believe you are innocent and falsely accuse you hold back forgiveness and you let them have what you think they deserve. Though your true heart condition is really truly hidden from you in this state, it's not hidden from God. Just because you were mistreated, you do not have permission. You do not have permission to hold on to that offense. Two wrongs will never make a right. The next condition that I want to talk about is how we cure it. And it'll be the cure. We've been offended and deceived. We've got to start recognizing our true heart condition, then we begin to think about the cure. What is the real cure for the way I feel now? Now that I've been offended, and we know offended and offense will come. In the book of Revelation, Jesus addressed the church of Laodicea by first telling them how they saw themselves as. Now I want you guys just to listen to me just a second. Everybody get my attention? All right? Everybody listening real good? Yes. The church of Laodicea. Listen to them. This is how they saw themselves. Are we really like this? Maybe, I don't know. But he began to talk and address this church. He says, you see yourself as rich and wealthy, and you don't have need for nothing. You can do it all on your own. And then by exposing their true condition, if you will, it begins to expose your true condition as you're wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Amen. Oh, he's talking to us? Amen. We think we got it all figured out. We've got a house. We've got a car. We've got a job. Good. Now, I don't need God. I'll go every now and then and make myself feel good and look good. But the truth is, when he begins to speak to them, he begins to talk to them, Jesus begins to tell them, you wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked person. Whew. Revelation chapter 3, verses 14 through 20. Read it. It's good. Uh, they had a mistake in their financial. I talked about this last week. I said, well, I just want to segue into this way. They had, they had mistaken their financial strength for spiritual strength. They had mistaken their financial strength. By, by or for spiritual strength. So they thought, well, pride hit the true condition. Yeah, I shared with you last week, that was me. That was me. I came to a place where it's got to be all right. Pride got in the way. It blinded me. Pride comes before the fall. And if pride comes before the fall, the truth is this. It's been hidden from me. It's my fault. Let me keep going. That's not very popular preaching today. Amen. Jesus began to tell them what they were how to get out of their deception. They have been deceived to buy gold, is what he was telling them here. Now listen, I, I want to kind of go through this gold piece now. And gold and silver, same, okay, different, different, but they go the same way. It's in the Bible differently too here for each one. But to buy gold is what he told them to see their true condition. You don't want to see your true condition? Look at the gold. You remember the silversmith? He said, when you purify it, you scrape all the scum off, there am I. What do I see when you look in there? You want to see me and not you. A reflection of Christ. 
to buy God's gold and to see their true condition, Jesus first instructed them for breaking free from the deception. And Revelation 3.18 was to buy from me gold refined by fire. Look, I'm going to make a point right here. Have you been refined by the fire? Refined gold is soft and it's very pliable. Refined gold is very soft and very pliable. It's free from corrosion and substances. And it is when gold is mixed with other metals such as copper, iron, nickel, and so on that it becomes hard and less pliable and more corrosive. Mm -hmm. This mixture is called alloy. The higher the percentage of foreign metals, the harder the gold becomes. And immediately we see the parallel of what's being explained here. A pure heart is like pure gold. A pure heart is like pure gold. Soft, tender, and pliable. Is our heart in that condition? In Hebrews 3.13, it states this. The hearts are hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Mm -hmm. Hebrews 3.13, our heart is, listen to me now, is hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. If we do not deal with an offense, everybody say offense. Yes. It will produce more fruit of sin, such as bitterness, anger, and resentment, than we ever wish to have. We've got to deal with the offense and still allowing it to make us bitter. This added substance I was talking about when we're, when we're doing gold, it hardens our hearts too, right? So we talk about that salt, pliable gold, but we begin to have all these other alloys, these other foreign materials, we begin to allow it to come in. You see the parallel? We're soft and pliable when we come to know Christ, and all of a sudden things begin to happen, offenses happen, we don't handle them right, and things begin to come in and attach to us, and things begin to happen. This reduces or removes tenderness, creating a loss of sensitivity. We are hindered in our ability to hear God's voice, our accuracy to see in the darkened places of life. This is a perfect setting for deception to begin to give birth. The first step in refining gold is grinding it to power. So when you begin to refine gold, the first thing that happens is it's crushed or ground to a powdery substance. Think about this. Then mixing it with a substance called flux. Now we know this in the well world, right? Uh, we begin to look at this, the mixture is placed in a furnace and is melted by intense heat. The alloys and impurities are drawn to the flux and the rich to the, they rise to the surface and the gold, okay, the gold, which is definitely heavier, uh, it remains at the bottom of the barrel. The impurities such as copper, iron, and zinc are combined with the flux. It is removed and there it yields to pure gold. Amen? It's a pure metal. Now look at what God says in Isaiah chapter 48. In Isaiah chapter 48 and verse 10, Behold, I have refined you. Well, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know what I'm talking about. Everything should have checked you out and wiped you out and canceled you out. Amen. The things that should have destroyed you, the things that should have put you behind bars, the things that should have put you six foot under, that's real social distancing there. Amen? Amen. You know what I'm talking about, right? Yes. We know all about this, but you look at this, he says this, and it's, Behold, I have refined you. And then it goes on to say, But not a silver I have tested you in the furnace of affliction. <laughs> what? God, you talking to me? Yeah, he's talking to us, isn't he? Oh, that's well, excuse me. <laughs> Cover my part. It's good to take. All right, when your life becomes difficult, does complaining come to you naturally? When your life becomes difficult, it's not going to become difficult. Offenses are going to happen. Is your natural inclination is to say, hey, you know what? I'm going to start complaining instead of repenting. Amen? This verse shows us plain that God tests us in the first of affliction. So I'll skip past it. Without testing, we would never learn to trust God, nor would we ever grow. So, let's say this. If you are being tested or have been tested, it's with purpose. Amen? Amen. Amen. Yeah. Everybody going with that? Yes. Yeah. So we know that when we look at this gold, when we talk about the silversmith, the Bible says, once all the garbage is gone, when you look into the silver, what he wants to see is not you, but the reflection of Christ. No matter what you've been through today, no matter where you're at, no matter what impurities have attached to you, no matter what you've done wrong, who you've allowed into your inner court, no matter what bad decision that you have made, God is telling you that I am your definer, and I'm telling you that I will allow you to go through some stuff and through some affliction, and I'll begin to boil it up, and I'll begin to scrape it off, and I'll begin to position you exactly where I want you at, that no weapon for me gives you no more shadow over the And I'm exactly what I'm going to do. And I'm praising you up, I want to say. We believe it. 
don't we? Yes. 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 And again in 1 Peter chapter 1, 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 6 and 7. In this, you greatly rejoice, but now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials. You've been grieved by them. That the genuineness of your faith being much more precious than that gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Peter talks a lot, mentions a lot, trials and suffering several times in this letter. And in closing this morning, I want to talk about you. Have you been through the refiner's fire? Thank you, Jesus. God, I didn't like it. Huh, thank you anyway. Listen, I'm talking to us this morning. This ain't for everybody else in church. This is for you sitting here this morning. It's for me. Yeah. The truth is this. Check this out. God refines with afflictions and trials and tribulations, the heat of which separates impurities such as unforgiveness, strife, bitterness, Anger, envy, and so forth from the nature of God in our lives. Think about that. When you look at that scripture, in this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials. That the genuineness of your faith, the genuineness of your faith, think about that. <coughs> So we wrap our minds around this by thinking God refines, refines with afflictions. Have you been afflicted? Yes. yes. God refines with trials. Have you been through trials? God refines with tribulation. Have you been in tribulation? The heat of what you've been through separates impurities from you. What kind of impurities come your way? Is it the unforgiveness? Is it the strife that we allow to sneak in or the bitterness or the anger or the envy or whatever it might be? Has it sense of separated you as God's chosen people from the nature of God? Sin easily hides. Read it with me. Sin easily hides where there is no heat of trials and afflictions. Take a picture of it. Right. Write it down. This is take a while. That's right. Mm. This is it. That's the state of baby. This is still care about else you doing. They should have never crossed you or done you wrong anyway. You've got a right to that. It's not how it works, fellow believers. Think about what this says. Sin easily hides. That's what the deceiver wants. That's what the offense wants. That's what the betrayal is. Is it hides something where there's no heat in the trial of affliction, there's going to be no progress. We've got to be delivered from that. All believers face such trials when they let their their light shine into darkness. We talked about, I talked to a brother this morning about this. When you're shining your light, the devil is mad. When you are doing missionary work, the devil is mad. When you're telling somebody about Jesus, the devil is mad. Hey, hey, he's not shame on you. That's right. Because <laughs> you ain't doing something. Because the devil is always against you. He is always fighting you. He hates your guts. He wants to kill you. He wants to snuff you out. He wants to wipe you out. He wants to make you think that betrayal of sin is okay. That's not. Amen. So we need to see our true condition. We need to see our true condition as we close this morning. Jesus said our ability to speak correctly is another key to being free from deception. And listen, it says Jesus said our ability to see correctly. Amen. We can't see through that cloud half cloud, the glass half cloud again. We've got to be able to look through it. Often when we are offended, we see ourselves as victims. Uh, we begin to start this game called the blame game. Uh, those who hurt us, we justify our bitterness and our unforgiveness, our anger and our envy, envy our resentment. They begin to serve us. Everybody begins to say, who in the world is that person? Sometimes we even resent those who remind us of how we're acting when we should not ought to be any man. Sometimes we resent them. I don't know who you think you are. Judge me up in here anyway. You know what I'm talking about, right? Yes. I want you to get this. Jesus said our ability to see correctly is another key to being free from deception. After we begin to see clearly, we begin to understand what's going on. After the gold is a reference here. After we've been through the fire, they need to be gold there, amen? 
And gold is soft and it's pliable. It's something that's tender. And that's the way our heart should be. As the praise team comes up this morning in closing. In Revelation, I referenced it a minute ago, Revelation 3.18, for this reason, Jesus counseled, anoint your eyes, and your eyes, and your eye with salve, and, and that you may see. Now, what is that? See, see what? I began to wonder what this was in this reference, and it, it really is, so you can see your true condition, or you can see the truth. And that's what we need this morning. We need to have our eyes with salve on, so we can see truth about yeah. us. Yeah. This is individually, this is for you. Christ was showing the way of receiving the true value is not in the material possession, but in a right relationship with God. You'll yes. only repent when you stop blaming others and quit playing the blame game and always acting like you're the victim when you begin to see that you're the problem. You're the one that's not doing what you need to do. Amen. Then you can correct it. Until you think everybody else is the problem, you will always have the blame game, yep. the victim mentality, and you'll never see the true condition of your heart. I'm telling you that God wants us to have the cure this morning, and Jesus is still the reason. See, you see your true condition and come out of the sin this morning. As we stand over the house this morning, when we blame others and defend our own position, it's on a, look at it. What's the say? When we blame others and defend our own position, we are blind. When we blame others, defend our own position, we are blind. We struggle to remove the speck out of our brother's eye while there is a plank or a log in our eye. It is the revelation of truth that brings freedom to us. When the Spirit of God shows us our sin, He always does it in such a way that it seems to separate us. It brings conviction. It brings conviction, not condemnation. He's telling you, I want you to change this morning, whatever it is. I want you to see your true condition. As we begin to unpack the bait of Satan over the next six weeks, we begin to talk about a lot of things. I got a little plate. So we're going to open the altar right now. That's the way that works, right? Yep. I preach the nose well. That's all right. <laughs> we're going to open the altar so the altar is open. And you feel free to come on out there and you take authority over anything that the enemy's trying to lie to you about today. Amen? Amen. Just start music. Yes. Thank you, Jesus.
and let him expose him for who and what he is. Yes. Right. But today, hopefully, you can take away uh, from one thing, defenses are going to happen. But we've got to handle the defense correctly, amen? Yes. amen? So if we handle correctly, we'll handle them with what God says. We will not allow sin to hide in our lives. Right. And we think about this so often. We talk about, well, what's the sin? You know, what is it? What is the sin? What is it that God's dealing with you with? And here's the thing. He'll take your sin, and he'll cover it with the love of Jesus. Mm-hmm. He simply wants you to ask him to be invited and involved into exposing that sin. Amen? Amen. Amen. Don't worry about what everybody else says and thinks. I want you to think about this privately and individually. And you begin to think, what is that? It can be not doing good when you know you're supposed to do good. It can be pornography, you know, reading. And the list goes on. We think, oh, I thought it was deeper now. Like, whatever. Sin is still sin. Amen. And it's still always dealt with at the foot of the cross. Amen. 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 I want to encourage you not to miss the next five weeks of this series. You'll see how it's linked together and how God will speak to us individually. <laughs> And allow us to come out of the conditions that we find ourselves so often in because of offenses. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to come here today. And we thank you for the church and church family. But most of all, God, we thank you for your word that feeds us. So, Father, allow us to take this message this week and share with other people. God, we know people that's really been chewing up the bait of Satan. Those who don't know you or those who do, God, that need to hear this in the next five weeks in this series, God. God, let us so this just, just, just invite them here. And God, invite them knowing that God, you're at work. Father, we thank you for what you've done. God, we thank you that you begin to allow us to be a changed people. God, we thank you for your presence. So, Father, as we dismiss here today, we're about to have dinner, God. We ask that you would bless this food that you've so graciously provided for us. You bless our time of fellowship. You bless our time together, God, that we would be pleasing to your eyes and ears. Father, we thank you so much for how good you've been to us. And, God, we want to honor you. So, Father, as we dismiss, we give you all praise, all honor, and all glory. It is in the name of Jesus Christ that we pray and everyone said. Amen. 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 I don't want you guys to forget. Uh, they got um, chicken alfredo, lasagna, garlic bread, and all that stuff that's under the courtyard. Do not leave. We've got a lot. Okay, so we've been outside the courtyard. God bless. Have a great week.